Um, thank you for your patience while we go ahead and get everyone together and make sure that we have tested all of our AV. Um, so good day to everyone who is joining us for DevConf in 2022. I'm Leslie Hawthorne, and I will be your moderator for today's keynote panel. Uh, for my day job, I work as a senior manager in Red Hat's open source program office, where I lead the team that is focused on community engagement for industry verticals. Uh, today is my fourth DevConf, uh, but it's my first time addressing the audience for the virtual event. Uh, and I, I'm sure I speak for many of us when I say I look forward to us all uh, meeting together in Brno and having a wonderful coffee and enjoying sessions together in person for our future DevConf. Um, before we begin our keynote panel in earnest today, I'd like to pause for just a moment uh, for a virtual round of applause for the whole team working behind the scenes to bring uh, DevConf to us each year. And I would especially like to thank all of them for their hard work to just quickly change tactics um, and make sure that we could all continue to meet virtually. So we really much, very much appreciate everyone who's involved in bringing us DevConf. So thank you very much. If you want to say thank you in chat, that's also great. All right, so <laughs> awesome. So uh, thank you all for expressing your appreciation right along with me. Um, I'm excited that we have with, for our keynote today um, kind of a new perspective with uh, DevConf CZ's global audience, right? In our talk today, we're going to move beyond um, our delightful details about technical implementations, and we're going to do a, a deeper exploration of the value of open source software, open artificial intelligence, open content and open standards and how these will are all um, currently being used to create a better future for Europe's citizens. Um, our remarks today will explore the current state of the art for open in public policy, municipal governments, in academic areas, and we'll be looking at um, developments at the European Union wide level uh, within particular countries and also at the city level. Um, and I'm particularly excited today that we get to share together the impact of open in DevCon's own home city of Brno in the Czech Republic. Um, when we're thinking about the, the context for our remarks today, you know, it's really clear that open source software has been a foundational element in Europe's technology ecosystem for decades. Um, in only my 15 years or so working with the global open source community, I've been honored to know so many uh, European free and open source software developers many of whom run their own small to medium enterprises. They create and support open source solutions. They create um, business value. They create economic mobility for their employees. So, um, and I've always been excited about the power of open source to be able to do that, to, to foster small business growth and make sure that people can have a good life working together. Uh, and moving beyond just my own anecdata and personal experience, we also have the recent European Commission study from 2021 on the economic impact of open source software and hardware on the European Union economy. And the estimates from that study are that open source contributes to between 65 to 95 billion, with a B billion euros to the European Union's GDP. And then when we're thinking about things in the policy context, there's been um, several important developments over the past you know, 20 years opening up Europe's IT market and driving genuine freedom in the IT space. So we can think of examples as far back as the European Union's first version of their open source strategy that came to us in 2003. Uh, that was the foundation for providing the grounds to switch over to Linux for the public sector. Uh, then more recently, we have the Tallinn Declaration of 2017, which said that they uh, mandated the use, making use more use of open source solutions or open standards when building ICT systems. And then even more recently than that, we have the Berlin Declaration of 2020, which uh, further underscored the importance of open source as a key component of creating human-centered systems and innovative technologies in the public sector, but you know, also throughout Europe. And then if we think about um, the, the ways in which open source and open standards are being uh, institutionalized, being made a, an operationalized part of uh, how things are done in Europe. In just the past 18 months, we've seen a number of developments that, you know, underscore the significance and importance for open in Europe, such as the creation of an open source program office at the European Commission within Germany's Ministry of the Interior, uh, and most recently in France's in an interministerial digital directorate. Um, you know, I've already mentioned the European Commission's detailed study on open source software and hardware that was published just six months ago. 
And then if we look at the way that um, industry consortia organizations and software foundations um, have been continuing to advocate for open source throughout Europe from a business and policy perspective for, for a very long time, we also note that um, you know, the Eclipse Foundation took the notable action in July of 2021 to move its headquarters from North America to be based in, in Brussels, Belgium, because of all of the growth and activity for their work coming, um, you know, being driven largely through Europe. So it's with all of these recent events in mind that I bring our focus to today's keynote panel, Open Across Europe from the Continent to the Cities. Um, I'm honored today to be joined by four distinguished panelists three of whom can offer us their perspectives, not just as subject matter experts, but as uh, citizens of the Czech Republic and even current or possibly former residents of Brno. Uh, I am pleased to welcome to the stage, Mr. Marcel Kolaya, Ms. Lucy Smolka, Mr. Robert Spall, and Ms. Claire Dillon, uh, with and great thanks for their forgiveness, should I mispronounce their names. Uh, let's go ahead and meet all of our panelists individually. Uh, I will first introduce Mr. Marcel Kolaja, Quester of the European Parliament and Vice President of the Czech Pirate Party. He served until very recently as a Vice President of the European Parliament. He engages in the Committee on the Internal Market and Consumer Protection, the Committee on Culture and Education, and the Special Committee on Artificial Intelligence in the Digital Age. His work is mainly focused on topics related to the functioning society in the digital age, and he stands for Open Technologies, freedom on the internet, independence of media, transparency, and a united Europe. He is also a graduate of Masaryk University and a former resident of Brno. Thank you so much for joining us today, Marcel. Hello, uh, thanks for inviting me. Excellent. Um, I am now pleased to introduce Ms. Lucy Smolka, the lead of the Open Cities Organization in the Czech Republic as well as the co-founder and lead of the Open Content Organization and the Czech branch of Creative Commons. Lucy joins us today from Brno, where she is a lawyer specializing in law in the digital space and combining law and technology into modern social tools. Under her leadership, the Open Cities Organization helps municipalities with their digitalization and openness strategies, bringing together several Czech cities to collaborate and share code and other resources together. She is a frequent lecturer and published author on public licensing, copyright and software law, and is also a fellow graduate of Masaryk University in Brno, where she received her doctorate in intellectual property. Thank you very much for joining us today, Lucy. Thank you very much, Leslie, and thank you for having me here. I'm very happy to be here and uh, for the uh, chance to speak here today. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. And we will turn now to Mr. Robert Spall, a GIS specialist in the data and analytics department of the Brno City Municipality. Robert manages the ongoing program to ensure that the data resources of the city of Brno meet the needs of the city's residents from a content, functionality, and operational perspective. Uh, he is a subject matter in open data, and he is our third panelist from the Czech Republic and our third alumni of Masaryk University where he studied geographic information science and cartography. Thank you so much for joining us today, Robert. Thank you, Ma. Thank you very much, Leslie, and I'm looking forward to this, uh, this lively discussion. Wonderful. Uh, and last, but obviously certainly not least, I am pleased to introduce Ms. Claire Dillon. She is the Executive Director of the InterSource Commons Organization, which is a global community of practitioners with the goal of creating and sharing knowledge about using open source software best practices to do software development inside of organizations. She also helps organize the OSPO++ network to support the establishment of university and government open source program offices worldwide. In 2021, she was instrumental in setting up the Open Ireland Network, a community for those interested in advancing open source at a national level in Ireland. Previously, Claire was a member of Microsoft Ireland's leadership team and has spent more than 25 years working with developers and developer communities. She is a graduate of Trinity College in Dublin, where she studied mathematics. Thank you for joining us today, Claire. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. It's not often you get to say the good thing about a pandemic, but the good thing about this pandemic is that I'm here at this a virtual conference, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. We're very happy to have you. All right, friends, my thanks again to our esteemed panel. 
I'm sorry, my script is failing me. There we go. Um, so thank you to all of my esteemed panelists. Um, now that we've had the opportunity to meet all of them, let's go ahead and dive into how open is manifesting across Europe at the continental, national, and municipal levels. Uh, we'll begin today with a question to Marcel. Uh, Marcel, we are seeing an, a surge of interest around open source as a policy tool across Europe. Um, would you please share your insights with us about how open source open standards and principles of open collaboration are taking shape from your point of view um, as a quester and until very recently vice president of the European Parliament and also as a vice president of the Czech Pirate Party. Right. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. I, um, I am a member of the Bureau of the European Parliament uh, a third year now uh, for two and a half years in the capacity of a vice president of the European Parliament, now as a quester. And um, um, the most important thing uh, for me um, in, in for my work in the Bureau, and you know, I also I need to add that the two and a half years um, I was uh, a vice president for uh, ICT. Uh, I worked in, um, in the ICT Innovation Strategy Working Group of the Bureau of the European Parliament, and I was responsible for ICT in the European Parliament. And uh, um, for me, the, the most important thing was uh, uh, to make sure that open source solutions are uh, taken as default in the European Parliament. And that is uh, now uh, currently the case. Uh, probably we don't need to go into the details of uh, the internal procedures um, in, uh, in the Bureau of the European Parliament and how uh, this can be achieved. But um, the fact is that at this moment, um, uh, solutions based on open source are default. Uh, I can uh, give you an example um, uh, now uh, with uh, the pandemics that already has been mentioned, I, I use it as an example. Um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the parliament suddenly uh, had to completely change the way how it worked. Before then, everything happened face to face, uh, including meetings and most importantly, including voting. So you had for uh, not only the committees, but the, the voting sessions of the plenary, you had to gather all the MEPs in one time at one place. You had um, 700 MEPs at one place voting. And that, of course, was not possible with the pandemic to put 700 people in one room. Um, so uh, we, we had to um, basically, from day to day, completely change the way how we work. And we started to do voting remote. So um, in order to uh, be able to guarantee the integrity of, of the vote, um, uh, it uh, for me, it was extremely important that we um, uh, vote all votes by roll call, which means that we can identify which member of the European Parliament voted which way. and. Um, uh, that we could use as some kind of a procedural a guarantee of um, um, of um, uh, integrity of the vote because the parliament, of course, was not ready for any kind of formal verification um, through crypto cryptography. You know that um, the uh, that the voting uh, the voting integrity is guaranteed. Um, as you can imagine, um, this uh, was a bit. Um, uh, complicated because you know uh, different committees vote uh, a bit in a different way, and um, there was a system that was introduced um, in some of the committees that was called I vote, and um, as the name maybe suggests a bit, uh, it it worked with a proprietary application from Apple and required from every member of the European Parliament voting uh, to have an uh, an account with uh, Apple's iCloud, which I found totally unacceptable. And um, I worked um, on replacing the solution with an internally developed solution, which now currently is the case. Um, voting in the committees um, is now based on this internally developed solution. And why I'm speaking about this is that it is based on open source. Now, where the um, uh, where the line between the uh, 
understanding of the parliament uh, of the advantages of open source lies at this moment is that there is a clear understanding that by using open source technologies the parliament can you know save a lot of resources save a lot of money um, uh, make systems that can be reused or create systems that can be reused but where the understanding is still not is the advantage of the open source um, development model so the application unfortunately by itself is not open source in a way that you could look up the code uh, in a public repository that you could uh, you know file bugs maybe that you could do code verification that you could uh, improve uh, the code or fix issues that are in there so there is still a long way to go but uh, from this perspective um, uh, I think that we have already uh, gone um, quite some way now one of the major uh, issues that I have identified is you know the reluctance to use open source software is uh, uh, because of capacities and because of um, not really you know being able to understand which system is already out there and which could be used or reused and for that reason um, as an as a member of the European Parliament uh, I have um, I have uh, put forward a pilot project, uh, which is a way how how I could uh, um, uh, start with the European Commission a, a project um, that is um, that is financed from the budget of the European Union, and um, uh, I have put forward a project that is called now with the European Commission FOSEPS, which I always forget what it is so I have my little cheat sheet it's free and open source software solutions for European public services and um, the um, uh, the goal of the project is to uh, bring the together um, um, uh, the repositories of um, open source solution solutions for the public sphere uh, bring them together create a, a unified interface and enable sharing of experience um, and create some kind of a uh, knowledge sharing platform uh, that then could be used by public authorities so that you know the knowledge that we have with using open source solutions can be shared across them the aim is not to create another platform because that um, obviously does not work but it's more um to um uh to synthesize the work that is at it, that is already that has some results in other catalogs of uh, free and open source software that exists out there. Very cool. I had absolutely no idea about the proprietary voting applications taking place in the parliament. So that's thank you for your your service to make sure that those solutions are open source. Um, and I'm also very excited to hear about the ongoing work to continue cataloging all of the open source resources that are available for uh, use by public bodies, um, because I know that there have been some uh, excellent work done on that in the past. And the idea that we could have kind of a, a European wide catalog um, is very exciting. So thank you very much for those comments, Marcel. Um, so we will now turn to Robert um, for his uh, remarks from the perspective of a practitioner of open at the city level. I took bets on how long it would take me to interrupt. Can you yes, apparently put a little thing on here? I'm a ponytail. Okay, but you know you're making mommy look very unprofessional right now. Okay. Can you go back to your room, Linda? Yeah, because my key does. I was making me a ponytail after that. I have a big mess because they're like little ridges then there. Your mom is not really great at putting a ponytail in your hair when she's in the middle of her presentation, but I think you look very good now. Yeah. The Good. comment was that hurts. Well, I will do a better job when I'm not in the middle of a talk, okay? You didn't you put it too low down. Probably. Why don't you ask Scotty if he can help you? I did it myself. Hello, wonderful and patient people. I am packed out. <laughs> um, hi, Robert. Um, as we're thinking about uh, looking into what open means for Europe at the at the city level, at the municipal level, can you tell us some of the work uh, about some of the work done by the data and analytics team for Brno and how your group serves the city's citizens? 
Yeah, thank you, Leslie. Uh, yeah, our team is responsible for the management and development of Burner Urban Data Platform, data.burner.cz. Uh, by the way, for those listeners or viewers who do not speak Czech, it's also in English, so you can access it uh, as well. Uh, the platform serves as an entry point for anyone who needs the city data for their work, projects or research. We have already published over 120 high quality data sets ranging from the population data through transportational data to environmental data. Uh, on top of uh, the various formats or distributions available, uh, many of which are open standards such as uh, GeoJSON or GeoPackage, we also generate feeds for every data set which allows uh, anyone to just connect to the data and use them in you know, any way in any app or a system they want to build free of charge, free of any constraints. It's uh, just your open data. Uh, what needs to be mentioned, however, I think is the fact that we go with quality or quantity. So most of our data sets are continuously updated and have a complete metadata and detailed documentation if needed. And uh, this platform uh, enables our citizens and companies to have a seamless access to the city data, which saves uh, time and money for every normal, everyone, basically, including our own colleagues uh, who do not need to send countless emails uh, back and forth. Um, I would like to now mention uh, several apps or use cases that uh, incorporated our data. And for example, architects or construction engineers use 3D model of a city or app named uh, Kamsnim or Where with the Trash in English, you would say. Uh, the, this app uh, uh, navigates users to the nearest container for recyclables uh, and the app feeds the data directly from our database through the platform. Uh, there is also one uh, use case I would like to highlight, uh, uh, which is currently uh, uh, under undergoing or uh, currently we are we are working on that. Uh, we have a problem in the city of Brno uh, that many streets are very narrow, long, and one way. And when the garbage truck comes to a particular street, it clogs the whole street. So and there are like 20, 30, 45, 50 minutes uh, uh, traffic jams. And we had a couple of solutions, but most of them were really expensive, uh, how to solve that problem. So at the end, we decided that we will use the data platform to feed the positional data of trucks to the navigational systems, such as Waze and, uh, and uh, similar. So anyone with a car navigation or driving navigation can uh, easily, will be able to easily see that there is a, tr a garbage truck and they should avoid a certain street. So this will minimize the, the or hopefully it will re, uh, remove the whole problem. Uh, so this is, I think this is a perfect illustration how, of how these kind of uh, platforms can be, can be useful. Uh, there are many other examples like that and I could continue for a while, but the main point here I think is that as our society becomes more and more digital and as more and more processes go online, the importance of platforms, platforms such as this uh, are increasing and are becoming more of a necessity because it makes our lives easier. It makes our lives better and most importantly, the lives of our citizens. And although we are all, only at the beginning of the road and I think it's the, its impacts are still relatively small, I think we are going to see a rapid growth of importance uh, in the upcoming years. Thank you so much, Robert. I was just so impressed when you mentioned that all of your work was documented and uh, kept consistently updated and available with all metadata. Um, you folks should be very proud of your, your data hygiene and your practices. That's amazing. Um, I so rarely hear that. Um, so I appreciate your remarks. Thank you. Uh, we'll now turn to, uh, to Lucy to tell us more about how um, the different ways that open source is benefiting um, European cities beyond Brno, right? More widely throughout the entire um, Czech Republic. So Lucy, as we're looking at how the impact of open collaboration and co-creation and contribution um, across the Czech Republic, can you tell us more about the two organizations that you're leading, Open Cities and Open Content? And specifically, we'd like to know um, what collaborations across cities these groups have done, and I am also, if you have time and the desire to tell us, um, if these groups are also collaborating with um, organizations outside of the Czech Republic as well. 
Okay, thank you very much, Leslie. So I will briefly introduce uh, activities of our organizations. So at Open Content, we focus on legal issues of modern technologies and law on the internet. And among these areas, we are dealing, for example, with licensing of copyrighted works, with compatibility of software licenses, with legislation requiring, requiring public administration to digitize processes, that's also very topical right now. And uh, also we analyze gaps that um, current legislation did not think about. We are trying to uh, explain what you can, what you cannot do, what you can expect. Uh, right now we are also dealing with a number of issues concerning uh, legislative requirements for digitization and implementation in public administrations and cities. Um, open cities, uh, they focus directly on cooperation and support for cities interested in digitization, openness and data-based decision-making. And also, um, let's say, use of modern technologies to simplify public administration and facilitate access, orientation and um, providing information for citizens. Open cities try to bring together those cities uh, who are interested and who are active and who want to participate, participate in joint pro, uh, projects. So very important part of um, activities of open cities, apart from educational and consulting, consulting activities, it is uh, definitely development and operation of open source software. So we provide open source tools that cities can operate and they can use them either on their own or they can use our help. So we have, uh, we have projects. Um, one of them, uh, the oldest one is, um, is called Cityvisor, Cityvisor in Czech. And this project arose from cooperation of cities and Ministry of Finan Finances. And this project enables transparent and clear display of uh, municipal finances. So uh, the aim of this tool is to bring the, um, the budget, the budgeting closer to the citizens and uh, show it in comprehensible form and also, also simplify further, further work with the budget and simplify it for also for the analysts and for publicists also. Um, I would also mention another project of us and it's, uh, it's the open source software which helps with, with digitalization of the subsidy process. So the original version was created with the help of um, city of Prague 3, uh, let's say Prague 3 district and uh, then the open cities uh, took over the project and modified it and uh, developed it more and yeah now we are um, creating more and more functionalities uh, which helps the cities so the software uh, allows you to process the entire subsidy process and uh, the city can then have the entire application and and uh, all, all further steps uh, of the subsidy process, for example, to support sports or culture or, um, I don't know, establishing green areas in the city, it's all digitized in this in the software. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll mention one more project. Uh, it's, it's, it's our latest and it's, um, it's continuous scanning of uh, vulnerabilities. And this, this project, this software was uh, created in response to cities' concerns about cyber attacks and uh, about misuse of computing power or data or uh, leakage of documents. And it is, a, it is a supplement to penetration test. So it's not a penetration test, but it's, uh, it helps uh, with, with cybersecurity. Let's say it's... Um, like an antivirus program that looks for vulnerabilities uh, in the infrastructure of municipalities. So that's that's our latest. And 
Um, unfortunately, we, we have not found a similar organization which we could collaborate um, in, in other states, but we found some uh, very, very helpful and very, very great organization which are currently helping us with some other goals of us. Uh, I, I have to say uh, we are very lucky because we found partners who already have um, so much experience with open source and with establishing open source uh, program offices and open source hubs. And I must definitely mention um, Vienna Business Agency, which are which are uh, participating in a project with us. Also, amazing guys from Open Forum Europe, and of course our dear Red Hatters, uh, both from Brno and from abroad. So, thank you guys uh, for for your help. Um, thank you for the opportunity to serve um, on behalf of myself and um, and my fellow Red Hatters. Thank you very much for your remarks, Lucy. I appreciate it. Um, so we will now uh, move on from hearing about the wonderful work being done uh, in uh, the Czech Republic and also the exciting collaboration with Vienna as well. Um, so let's look at uh, kind of now change our lens to the idea of um, open source impact, but at the national level and uh, invite Claire uh, Dillon to, uh, to offer remarks focused on her home country of Ireland and also her uh, experience working with uh, some other folks working at the national level. Uh, so Claire, while we're really still in the in the early days when we think about institutional of open institutionalization of open source across Europe, um, Ireland though has had some early triumphs uh, around this with open source, particularly in the academic space. Um, would you please share more with us about how open is taking shape in Ireland uh, and the innovations that are occurring as a result? Certainly, thank you, Leslie. Um, so I, I, I would, I mightn't say triumphs in, in that respect, but, but, but I will say, you know, I think that when we see early wins, we absolutely need to celebrate them. And um, just to say that I came upon and began to learn about the open ecosystem and the potential for positive economic impact of open source software only in the last number of years. So I'm not one of, I'm not a long-term open source um, aficionado, but I am a, I'm all in now because I have learned in recent years about the, the potential positive uh, benefits of it. Um, and that was why I became involved in the OSPO++ network, which is a network for open source program offices in government and universities. And it's fantastic to see Lucy mentioning the fact that that is a trend that's, that's hitting the Czech Republic as well. Um, when I was started that work, um, it became obvious to me through various conversations that Ireland was not necessarily well known for their stance on open source. In fact, people really didn't know what was necessarily happening in Ireland. So uh, one of the things that uh, I wanted to do from that was, was actually uh, connect together the people in Ireland who were working in the open source ecosystem. Um, and it actually became a surprise to me, but a very, very pleasant surprise to find out that one of the first open source program offices in universities in Europe was actually actually from Trinity College Dublin, which was my alma mater. Um, and, and uh, you know, that was that was a surprise. I didn't know it existed until we started connecting the ecosystem in Ireland, because there are a lot of people in Ireland involved in open source, but they don't know each other. And, and there isn't a kind of a national awareness of what's happening, the global trends, or, or these benefits that can, um, can be gained from working in the open. So when we found out about the OSPO in Trinity, we were delighted. Um, and it's even more, I think, a little bit unusual than some other OSPOs in that it is actually came out of their tech transfer office, their TTO, um, which is actually quite unusual from, a, from, a, um, from an OSPO's perspective in university. But it was because they had an early recognition of the potential for startups to spin out of technology that was happening in Trinity, um, but to do it on, in the basis of, of operating in the open source ecosystem system or relying or somehow integrating the idea of open collaboration in their business model. Um, and there have been some great successes from that perspective in terms of startups in Ireland that are operating in this way. And it's, it's a fantastic thing to see. Um, and then when we think about that, I mean, in the context of that, the report that you mentioned earlier, um, the that came out uh, about the potential 
positive economic impact of open source for the European, uh, for, you know, that came out for the European Commission, but for all of Europe is, is uh, for everyone actually, but 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 specifically for Europe. And um, I think that there's a huge interest now to see, well, how can we accelerate that in terms of that um, indigenous innovation ecosystem in Ireland? So we're seeing a lot of interest from some of the other agencies in Ireland to see, well, okay, if this is an opportunity, then how can we support people who are operating in, in that area? Um, I'll also note that uh, in recent years, we had the, the second thing that happened more recently in Ireland was the fact that uh, we had the our COVID tracker app in Ireland um, was, was built and released then as open source software, primarily actually initially because they wanted to make sure that the privacy aspects and everything that they were doing was done in the open so that they would get buy-in from the citizens um, in terms of their trusting the software. Uh, but that was the first time certainly that i'm aware of that the health service executive had decided to do something in the open like that and it there then follow on became that one of the starter projects for the linux foundation public health uh, initiative and what's amazing to me about that is that it, it started to dawn on people that again i think like marcel mentioned that open source isn't necessarily just about the idea of reducing cost or you know um, getting reuse, but that there is this ability for people to collaborate in order to gain trust of citizens, to have transparency and for it to be better, better, um, more easily adopted, but also to facilitate these kind of cross-border um scenarios so from our perspective the same code was used in northern ireland as in the republic of ireland which really helped when it came to uh, navigating the restrictions around covid on the island of ireland for example um, and that sense has been gone on to, to be used in, in other scenarios as well so for me it was one of the first times that you saw people recognizing these additional benefits other than cost and reuse and these practical elements but how open source and open collaboration is almost necessary for us to be able to tackle some of the challenges that are coming at us so fast so i you know personally speaking i think it's amazing when we start to see these trends in europe and what the opportunities are um, and more recently still in open Ireland network we had some government representatives come on and say that they were very keen to work with organizations like for example the un digital impact alliance around things like GovStack and and, and to try and look at how instead of everyone building everything for themselves, how can we collaborate across borders to actually be more efficient, but also to make things work across borders. So I'm delighted to hear and learn about, uh, you know, the, the stuff that is happening in the Czech, Czech Republic. And um, I would love to follow up with Lucy afterwards around the, the Open Cities Initiative, because for me, this is it, it's the it's the these kinds of connections and collaborations um, that I think can can really help demonstrate the additional value that open source and open collaboration can bring. Um, because I do think that that narrative for people outside this ecosystem needs to change. So they're not thinking about it just as, uh, sure, I can get something for free, but it's more to say, how else would you tackle these global problems? The only way to do it is through collaborating and working together. Thank you so much for those wonderful remarks, Claire. And I, uh, I know that in some of our past discussions, we've really talked about this uh, process of institutionalizing open source is really all about bringing together the people who are already engaged in that as a discipline and helping them to find the folks who will uh, collaborate with them um, within their own you know, department or their own team, and then all the way out to the, the entire globe of folks who want to volunteer uh, to, to spend their time together uh, getting the right things done for all of, all of civil society. So thank you so much for that. Uh, folks, I want to just do a quick um, check-in with our audience. We have had so much wonderful stuff to share today that we haven't even gotten to our second round of questions and we're supposed to conclude our panel in seven minutes so um, i'm just going to do a really quick um check in with my panelists would you find folks like us to draw our attention out of the chat and ask for audience questions um or because i'm happy to do that since we have a little bit less time okay cool i'm seeing some thumbs up and then if we don't have any questions from our fine audience members, um, Marcel, I'm gonna ask you what was gonna be our concluding capstone question. And then we're all gonna enjoy the rest of DevConf together, if that's okay. I'm seeing nods and delights, so that's wonderful. All right, fine folks who are watching the live stream, I look to the chat function in our uh, event platform hop in now, if you have any 
questions you want to ask or feedback you want to give the participants. I'm going to quickly scroll up. I see a lot of clapping. That makes me feel good about that. Pleased that we are all having a good um, session here together. And uh, people need coffee. I agree with this as a stance at all times, I have to say. Um, do, 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 do. Let's see. I agree. Masaryk University rules, and I still think I didn't learn to pronounce it correctly, but I have been practicing and probably not well enough. Uh, we had a comment from Lubos, but Marcel has responded to this. Um, oh, there's a Q&A tab. Thank you, Pavel. You are a wonderful human being. <laughs> um, okay, but we do not have any questions from today. So that is okie dokie pokey. All right. Um, so Claire has asked, um, I would love to, or has, has stated um, that she would love to add that if uh, folks are interested in learning more about the um, OSPO++ plus plus network, please feel to reach out or to visit uh, ospoplusplus.com. Um, this is a group of, um, the, I think the best way that, to put it, and Claire should absolutely correct me if I'm wrong, is this is a, uh, a loosely affiliated of people who are uh, well acquainted and deeply committed to the idea of creating open source program offices for uh, government or for academic institutions. And when we say government, this could be, you know, European Parliament. This is things like the European Commission. This is at the city level. This is at the national level. And the idea there being not only that um, open source program offices are good because they help with open source and doing more open source related activities, but really it's about that the ability for people to connect with one another. Because if you know that someplace has an open source program office, you, you are likely to know exactly where to go to find the people that you need to collaborate with, right? Otherwise, um, you know, if you're talking about, uh, you know, government style open source things, it, it could be that, you know, in France, you're talking to the Ministry of the Interior, or excuse me, that's Germany. In Germany, you're talking to the Ministry of the Interior. In France, you're talking to the uh, uh, digital directorate. So how do you even find the people you're supposed to be able to, to connect with? So. OSPO++ plus plus is here as a, as a group to establish connective tissue between folks who are engaged in this sort of work. And um, I hang out on their calls. I always learn something new. So I absolutely invite folks to come along. All right, since we have not gotten any, any further audience questions, I'm going to turn the stage back to Marcel and ask our final question. Um, so Marcel, gathering together all of our themes for today, um, you know, I'd like to ask you to examine a common thread uh, among them, right? So now we are about to enter into the Czech presidency of the European Union later this year. So can you give us your thoughts on what the Czech presidential agenda should look like when it comes to open source and open innovation, please? Right, uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so first we need to realize what actually the presidency uh, in the Council of the European Union is. And in short, that is an opportunity to uh, set the, um, uh, the direction for uh, the whole union for the six months that the Czech Republic will have this opportunity. So, and one of the key um, tasks for the presidency is to finish the negotiations on the open legislation. So unless the French presidency that you know, is currently uh, the French now currently have the presidency, um, unless they finish uh, the legislation, the negotiation on the legislation on the Digital Markets Act, then uh, um, this is what the Czech pres presidency should take as an utmost priority. Uh, that is a legislation that um, will help to tame um, the big tech giants that are currently basically concentrate a, a, a lot of um, uh, market share on some specific digital markets like social networks or chat platforms, um, uh, search engines, et cetera. And um, um, why I speak about that in connection with open source is that um, what, what I, I was able to push through in the negotiations in the European Parliament is a principle of interoperability. So these tech giants uh, uh, like Google, Facebook, Apple, 
they uh, would be required to, uh, to to open their services like social networks and chat platforms um, uh, for interoperability so that uh, competitors, um, including, of course, um, um, open source uh, services like, for instance, Mastodon for, um, uh, for a social network, they could interconnect and interoperate with them and, and that this would solve one of the major uh, issues for uh, for for them when it comes to getting actually some users because nobody wants to be on a network where, where there are no users. Um, of course, it would be really handy uh, in that sense uh, if I may have a little ask um, uh, to you know go to your respective governments and and tell them about this how this how this is important uh, and that um, we should in the Council of the European Union uh, push for this principle of interoperability. Uh, also, um, um, there is a, a plan for a proposal for an EU government's interoperability strat strategy that is foreseen in um, the second quarter uh, of this year. And um, we would like to see the presidency uh, committing to advance the, uh, the discussions on this file. And uh, last um, um, but not least that I will mention is that the Czech presidency will um, 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 have on the table uh, to finish or at least advance negotiations on uh, the regulation of artificial intelligence, the Artificial Intelligence Act. And over there, uh, there is, of course, a huge potential uh, to, um, uh, to shape the legislation uh, in a way that, uh, you know, transparency is one of the uh, most core principles how to make the use of artificial intelligence fair and uh, not discriminating um, and of course all of us know that open source software is um, the best positioned uh, to um, you know take leverage of uh, this requirement that is really important for the future so that would be my three examples thank you so much for those little remarks marcel um near and dear personally to my heart. Um, so uh, I wanna thank everyone who uh, attended our, our panel discussion today, our keynote, and um, also uh, thank you very much to anyone who may be viewing this uh, video later on. I also wanna once again thank my esteemed panelists for joining us today and sharing their time and their wisdom with us on Saturday um, because, you know, thank you. Uh, we're very happy that you were able to share your perspectives and uh, you know spend some of your day with us here today. Once again, thank you to all of the folks who are organizing DevConf once again this year. We look forward to thanking you, uh, we hope, in person next year. Uh, and finally, I would like to just um, note to members of the audience who may be interested in these sorts of topics, the Open Forum Europe uh, group from Brussels, their uh, public policy think tank in Brussels, uh, we'll be hosting an event on uh, European Union public policy next week. It is completely free of charge to attend. Sessions are also offered after the fact on video. So if you would like um, to continue your learnings in this area or have an opportunity to talk to other speakers who are touching on these same themes, please do consider uh, attending the Open Forum Europe public policy event next week. Uh, I thank you all for coming and I look forward to seeing you in a future DEVCOM session. Thank you. Cheers, folks. Thank you very much as well. Cheers. Thank you. Bye-bye. Have a nice Thank day. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Great conference. Thank you, Leslie. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Cheers. Bye-bye.